Hi, thanks for tuning into our presentation on relatively complete verification of probabilistic programs. I'm Benjamin Kaminski, and this is joint work with Kevin Butts, Jos Peter Katun, and Christoph Mattia. I will now try to explain to you on one slide what our whole paper is about, and we'll first look at the situation for ordinary, that is non-probabilistic programs. So we are given a program C and a specification, a post condition F and a precondition G. And we want to verify that whenever we start in precondition G, the execution of C will terminate in post condition F. How do we verify this? Well, we first determine what is the weakest precondition such that execution of C takes us to post condition F. And then we check whether our specified precondition G implies this weakest precondition. If we can successfully check this, then we have indeed verified that whenever we start in G, the execution of C will terminate in F. Now, how do we express F and G? For this, we use first order arithmetic. And first order arithmetic has a very nice property in this context, which is called expressiveness. Expressiveness means here, whenever I specify the post condition in first order arithmetic, then the weakest precondition is also expressible in the language of first order arithmetic. This is actually far from trivial to prove, but the proof of this fact gives us as a byproduct an effective construction from this post condition to the precondition. So this is actually an algorithmic procedure from here to here. And this now means that this verification task is effectively decidable, almost. Why almost? Well, we can effectively construct this predicate and the precondition is also effectively given to us. The only thing that's left to do is to check this single implication here. And this is something that we unfortunately have to offload to some solver or more generally to some oracle because this is undecidable. But this gives us in total relative completeness. So the weakest precondition calculus together with first order arithmetic is complete for program verification relative to the fact that we have to use an oracle for this single implication here. Now, we want to uh, make a relatively complete verification system for probabilistic programs. So for probabilistic programs, Cosen in the early 80s was the first to realize that these uh, Boolean valued predicates here should be generalized to real valued functions. So this post condition f generalizes here to a real valued function f. And the WP operator now generalizes from taking a weakest precondition to actually taking the expected value of f after executing c. The precondition also becomes a function and checking an implication now generalizes to checking an inequality between this function g and this function, which is also called the weakest pre-expectation of f. Yeah, and we want that this should also be effectively decidable, but now modulo an oracle for checking this inequality between two functions. And how do we achieve this? Well, we need a syntax, but this syntax now has to be for functions, and it should be in a way such that whenever we specify a post function f here in the syntax, then the weakest pre-expectation should also be expressible in this syntax. And moreover, we would like that the construction from f to the weakest pre-expectation of f should be constructive. Okay, so if you're not sold on the fact that we would really like to have a syntax, I will give you some further motivation. Um, I believe a syntax is really what uh, enables or boosts tool support, right? So because in some way we want to describe to 
uh, a machine what a function f really is and usually this is done in some sort of language or syntax uh, and implicitly this is already done in many tools so there's uh, a lot of tools um, who do reasoning on, on super martingales or in particular ranking super martingales and these often use linear or polynomial or exponential templates yeah, uh, a general syntax, uh, I think, is also something that enables a guided search for specialized fragments. Uh, in, in these fragments, maybe some questions do become decidable. For instance, in separation logic, or also in first order logic, some syntactic fragments are, uh, have a decidable entailment. And uh, what I really hope is that uh, we can have some sort of knowledge transfer from Boolean reasoning or logical reasoning to quantitative reasoning. Okay, I will now give you an overview of the rest of the talk and then we'll get this long talk going. So I will first give you an introduction to expectation-based reasoning. In particular, uh, go into details about weakest pre-expectations and give a few examples. I will then present to you the syntax that we have developed. Uh, I will show you a few requirements that we have on this syntax and then present you the syntax itself. And uh, then we'll go through the expressiveness proof uh, in only very few details and then I'll speak a little bit about relative completeness and then show you uh, a small example. Okay, let's start with expectation-based reasoning. So what are expectations? Uh, well, you should read expectations, but you should really think a random variable. Right? An expectation is not an expected value per se. And the space of expectations that we consider are functions f that associate program states uh, to quantities. Sorry, quantities to program states. So, and our quantities are positive real numbers or infinity. We have a complete lattice structure on these expectations, so we can order them. We have already seen this inequality relation. This is just defined point-wise. So f is smaller than g if f, the real number evaluated in every state that I can plug in here, is smaller than for g. Now, what are weakest pre-expectations? Uh, we are given a probabilistic program C and uh, a post expectation f, so some function mapping states to positive reals or infinity. And we ask, what is the expected value of f after executing the program c? Here is a picture. So we start in some initial state sigma. Then the probabilistic program may take uh, different branches here due to the internal randomness. And we end up in different terminal states, tau1, tau2, tau3 here, and each with some probability. So in the end here, we have a probability distribution over final states. And in this, in each final state, we measure the quantity f, and then this each of these happens with their own probability, and then we take a weighted average, so we take the expected value here over all these quantities. Now we could have started with a different initial state, sigma prime, then the computation might go a bit differently. We might end up in different terminal states, but still we again measure f in every terminal state and take the expected value. And the weakest pre-expectation is now a mapping from this initial state to this expected value. So each initial state is mapped to its uh, according expected value. Here are a few examples of weakest pre-expectations. So what value do we expect for x squared after we have set x to 5? Well, this is obvious. This is 5 squared, which is 25. Uh, for 10, this is 10 squared, which is 100. So let's now look at something probabilistic. 
So with probability 4 over 5, we set x to 5. And with the remaining probability 1 over 5, we set x to 10. What is the expected value of x square after doing this? Well, it's 4 over 5 times 25 plus 1 over 5 times 100, which is 40. Now, a bit more interesting. With probability a half, we do nothing. And with probability a half, we increase x by 2. What is the expected value of x after doing that? Well, with probability a half, nothing happens, so it's still x. And with probability a half, x is increased by 2. So overall, we get x plus 1 as the a priori expected value of x evaluated in the final states. I will now show you the syntax that we have developed for these expectations. So remember, we want a syntax, if you remember the slide, such that whenever we start with some post expectation f in this syntax that we're going to develop, then we want that this is closed undertaking weakest pre-expectations. Okay, here are a few requirements basically on this syntax, or if you will, a wish list. So here's a program, it's not even probabilistic, but we want to know what value can we expect for y after executing this program. And in fact, this is y plus x squared plus x halves. And we see here that we go from something linear to something quadratic here. So for instance, if we just had a syntax that gives us linear functions, this doesn't suffice. So we need to, uh, we need at least polynomials. Um, to see something worse, here's another program. And we want to know what is the expected value of the constant function 1. Now this program is probabilistic and it doesn't terminate with probability 1 because um, here we move away from 0 with probability a half and we go to 0 with probability half but we move further away than we uh, move towards 0. And asking for the expected value of 1 is basically the same as asking for the termination probability. And in this case, well, this is a rational number, of course, 1. But the termination probability is square root of 5 minus 1 halves, which is an irrational number, namely the reciprocal of the golden ratio. So here we see we go from rational to irrational. So in some sense, this is even, even more complicated. What's also possible, we can go from rational to non-algebraic numbers, and we can go from linear expressions to non-computable uh, numbers. Right? So if we can, for instance, express Chaitin's constant. Okay, now I will show you a syntax that is surprisingly easy and which can do all of the stuff that we just saw before. So first of all, we'll introduce arithmetic and Boolean expressions. So arithmetic expressions are almost standard. I'll just show a few things that it might not be standard. So an arithmetic expression can be a non-negative rational. We want to work only with non-negative uh, quantities. So that's why we restrict to non-negative rationals here. Uh, it can be a non-negative rational valued variable x. We have normal addition and multiplication. And we have a subtraction that is also truncated at 0 because we don't want to get negative. For Boolean expressions, this is completely standard. We have a comparison of arithmetic expressions. We have conjunction and negation. OK, now we'll see the syntax for the actual expectations. So what can an expectation be? It can either be an arithmetic expression. Here's an example, just x. It can be a guarded expectation. So we can guard an expectation f with the indicator function of a Boolean expression. Here's an example. So this expectation here, 
this evaluates to x if x times x is smaller than y. Right? If x times x is smaller than y, then this whole thing evaluates to 1, and then 1 times x is x. And if this is not true, then this evaluates to 0, and 0 times x is 0. Yeah, we have addition of expectations. We can scale an expectation by an arithmetic expression. And then we have uh, probably the two most interesting constructs. These are, so to speak, quantifiers. These quantifiers are the supremum and the infimum quantifier. So what does this mean here? We take a supremum over all non-negative rational values for x and replace uh, these in f. Yeah. So here's an example. Uh, now basically this supremum quantifier bounds this variable x and it takes all possible rational uh, positive rational values for x and takes the supremum over this quantity. So it seeks for the largest x, so to speak, such that x times x is still smaller than y. y is a non-free variable here. And then the whole expression evaluates to this largest x. Well, and because this doesn't exist, we take the supremum. And in fact, this whole syntactic expectation here expresses square root of y without ever introducing square root to this syntax here. If we can express an expectation f in this way, by this grammar, then we say that f is syntactic. All right, here are a few examples of uh, syntactic expectations. So expectations that we can express in our syntax. And remember our variables are only rational valued. So we can express, for instance, polynomials. Polynomials are widely used, uh, as I already said, as templates for martingale-based reasoning. We can express also rational functions. We can express square roots. We just saw that. Uh, what's also quite cool is we can express, for instance, harmonic numbers. And harmonic numbers occur very frequently in the analysis of randomized algorithms. What's interesting here, the x harmonic number is uh, 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 and so on plus 1 over x. And this is a sum which has a non-constant number of summons, right? Because x is a free variable and x tells us the number of summons here. But we can express this as, um, as a syntactic expectation using the quantifiers. All right, I will now show you that this very, very simple syntax is indeed expressive. Uh, and we will not look at the full proof because the, the proof for loops is quite involved, but I will give you a glance at how this works. All right, so this is what we want to prove. We want to prove that if f is syntactic, then the weakest pre-expectation of f is effectively syntactic. And effectively syntactic now means it's a syntactic and b we can even effectively construct the syntax for this expectation here. Okay, we prove this by induction on the structure of C. So for the base case, we have skip. Skip doesn't do anything. So WP of skip of F is just F and F is syntactic by assumption. For the assignment, X becomes arithmetic expression A what we do is we replace in f every occurrence of x by a. And this is really a syntactic replacement. So if f was syntactic, then f where x is replaced by a is naturally also syntactic. OK, this concludes the base cases. So as an induction hypothesis, we basically now assume that for two arbitrary but fixed programs, c1 and c2, and arbitrary post expectations, we can effectively uh, construct a syntax for the weakest pre-expectations here.
Okay, and now we do the induction step on the compound statements. So for the if then else, we have uh, this. So if I do C1, otherwise do C2. And well, if C, if phi is true, then the expected value of this is whatever the expected value for C1 is. And if phi is false, then it's whatever the expected value for C2 is. Uh, and C, uh, the weakest pre-expectations for C1 and for C2, these are syntactic by the induction hypothesis. The guarding here and here, this is syntactic by definition, and the addition is also syntactic by definition. Okay, for the probabilistic choice, it's almost the same, but instead of the guarding here, we do a multiplication on this what we call scaling by a rational. Yeah, so P, P is a rational probability here, and one minus P is also a rational. And the addition is uh, also syntactic, as we just said. Uh, finally, for the, for the sequential composition, this is completely obvious by uh, just applying the induction hypothesis twice. Okay, now the only uh, thing that's really, really difficult is the proof for loops. And this is where I'm not going to give you all the details because as you can see here, this is a semi-syntactic representation of how the syntactic expectation for loops looks like. So while phi do body, and uh, here we can see that we have the post expectation f here guarded by the negation of the loop guard. And this is a sum over all possible sequences of states. We have to express this in some syntactic way. This is a product. And this is a product over computation paths or over multiple uh, iterations of um, the loop body. And here we aggregate the probability of doing multiple iterations. And here we see we go from one state to another state in this sequence of states. And then we sum over the whole computation tree. And this is what is roughly the intuition behind this very large expectation. And because we want to eventually collect all possible sequences of states that could have occurred, we uh, take a supremum here over k, and k is the length or the depth of the computation tree. Okay, what are the technical challenges in this proof? Well, we have to encode the sequence of states somehow via goodalization. This is, by the way, also what happens in the traditional, uh, so to speak, proof of um, relative completeness for non-probabilistic programs. Um, what is different for us, we have to encode not sequences of natural numbers, but sequences of rationals also by algorithmization. This is still uh, okay, I would say. What's really more difficult is we have to express sums with a variable number of summons, as we can see here. It's similar to the harmonic numbers where we also had to do that and we have to do that as syntactic expectations as well and similarly for this product we also have to express this as a syntactic expectation and this is actually the constructions for this are quite involved yeah this basically concludes our look into this proof if you want to see more details for loops basically half of the paper is the proof for loops, then uh, I uh, would uh, invite you to look into our paper. So we have now proven relative completeness of the weakest pre-expectation calculus together with our syntax. So again, to recap, what does this mean? Given a probabilistic program and a syntax for pre and post expectation, what can we effectively do? We can effectively construct a syntactic expectation, which is the weakest pre-expectation of 
uh, f with respect to the program c. What is only relative uh, so is um, that if we want to ask whether g is smaller than wpc of f, then we have to offload checking this signal inequality to some sort of solver or oracle. Uh, and this gives us now uh, completeness in the sense of Cook, uh, who proved uh, completeness of Hall logic, relative completeness of Hall logic. All right, here is now an example of our syntax in action, so to speak, for a loop. So here we want to know what is the expected value of x. What does this loop do? It keeps flipping a coin and then it decides whether to terminate or not. And in x, it counts the number of loop iterations it did until it finally stops. So what's the expected value of x? If we just use our construct construction, then we get this very lengthy uh, expectation. And actually, some state sequence path, these are all uh, shorthands for much, much longer syntactic expectations. So if we write the whole thing, um, this would actually span over a page or something like that. And this thing here expresses exactly this semi-syntactic uh, expectation that I showed you in the proof uh, for the loop. OK, now this is the constructive part. The good thing is we can also write the same expectation here as x plus c is larger than 0 times 2. This is the expected value of x after executing this program. And this is now much simpler. And it's an equivalent expectation. It's equivalent to this thing over here. But it's much simpler. And this is, of course, also in our syntax. So this means. Uh, in general, if we look for invariance or something like this, then we don't have to start right uh, here looking for very complicated things. But we can, in our syntax, also find very simple expectations, which still express the same thing. OK, let me now conclude what we have seen and what is future work. So we have seen an expressive syntax for weakest pre-expectations. This makes this question, is G smaller than the weakest pre-expectation of F with respect to program C, almost effectively decidable, modulo an oracle for checking this um, inequality. So in total, uh, we would argue that this gives us a really a suitable syntax for specifying quantitative assertions. What is future work? We would like to prove uh, expressiveness of our syntax also for the expected runtime calculus that was presented four years ago. Um, we would also show like to show that our syntax is expressive for weakest liberal pre-expectations, which is a notion of partial correctness for probabilistic programs. Um, we would also like to show that our syntax is expressive for programs with binary non-determinism. So instead of a probabilistic, we have a real non-deterministic choice. We currently have no idea how to do this. We would like to develop a syntax for quantitative separation logic. This was actually my idea in the beginning when we started this whole project. This was actually my goal, but um, we didn't quite get there. And the problem is that quantitative separation logic involves countable non-determinism, which is even worse than binary non-determinism. And we currently don't know how to prove expressiveness for non-determinism. And finally, it would be very cool if we could also develop a syntax for programs with continuous sampling and conditioning. We've not looked into this program problem so far at all. All right, thanks for your attention. And uh, yeah, if you do have any questions, ask them at the 
broadcast presentations or do drop us an email. Thanks.